Alright, alright, boys and girls. What's up, what's up, what's up? It's your boy BQ and I got Mike here with an episode of the Impact Republic podcast. It's been several months since we've uh, knocked any of these out. You guys know I've been taking just a, just a break from everything for a while and Impact Republic is a, a podcast that I think we knocked out two or three episodes of previously. It is a monthly podcast that we're doing just talking all things Impact Wrestling um and since it's been a while since we did this mike uh run us through real quick just um what you got going on uh with with your podcast uh and, and the patreon and everything and then we'll uh we'll, we'll get in the get in what's going on what's good with impact awesome man well thanks bq thanks for having me back it's our, our monthly podcast that we do about every three or four months so it's good it's good to be it's <laughs> we'll good to be that. back on the show yeah we'll um so yeah. So right now I, I, uh, I write for a website called uh, fight game media. It's ran by Garrett Gonzalez and um, I do a lot of cool stuff. I get one or two columns a week out of there. And then I also have a, uh, a podcast. It's on their Patreon. It's called fight uh, fight game or patreon.com slash fight game media. My podcast is called brace for impact. I also uh, clip the podcast every week for the YouTube channel. And, uh, you know, I usually air, you know, 10 to 15 minute um, clips per week. And then I actually do some exclusive stuff like a, uh, we did an exclusive uh, Slammiversary preview, and then we did a live post show after Slammiversary on the Fight Game Media YouTube channel. And I also just recently uh, did an interview with Moose, uh, and that was um, um, aired for the uh, for the YouTube channel. It was also a part of our Patreon too. So a lot of cool content coming up on the uh, the Fight Game Media Patreon network. Dude, I gotta say that Moose interview was really good. Um, I've heard several Moose interviews, and. I don't know if he's just not engaged <laughs> or what. He actually did an interview for us years ago. Um, it, it's probably to this date my lowest, the, the worst interview we've ever had, uh, <laughs> engagement wise, because he was he was just. I didn't I didn't conduct the interview, um, but he he clearly didn't want to do <laughs> didn't want to be there. Um, yeah. So you know the trick with uh, the trick with Moose is uh -huh. I had to hit him right away with a bunch of compliments. And that, you know, that got him loosened up a little bit. And then uh, we, we were able to engage. Yeah, he was, uh, he had some energy. He was, he was, he's, he it sounded like he was enjoying himself. And it was just, it was a good show, man. It was, uh, I really enjoyed listening to it. Oh, well, thank you. I, I haven't conducted an interview in a little while. Um, last one was like Rohit Raju, and it must have been like two, two and a half years ago. Impact doesn't give me interviews. And it's funny because, I talk about this a lot about knowing who your target audience is. And it's like they contact Vicky Guerrero's podcast. Cause she clearly has, you know, more listeners than I do. She knows nothing about the impact product. She asked Eddie Edwards if it was his first slam anniversary, <laughs> you know? So, you know, are you really, uh, are you really reaching a target audience, you know, in instead of uh, someone like myself, but it's whatever, it's all good. So I, I think what, what, impact likes to do is they like to go after those people that aren't watching the show as opposed to getting the people that are watching this the show to try to buy their pay-per-views right they're they're not trying to leverage their all the fan base that they already have they're trying to get the fan base that doesn't exist yet or or reach you know the aew fan base or the new japan fan base or the wwe fan base as you can see through their social media they're constantly tweeting out current wwe stars that used to be in, in impact i think that's just kind of a strategy of theirs um because I, there's this theory that I think the WWE has had for a long time and that the impact had that it, it failed for impact where they believe that the hardcore audience was always going to be there. And that's not the case, right? Yeah. Like that, that audience continues to shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink. And they, instead of they, they, they're trying to get these people who don't actually watch the show and don't appreciate the show instead of just focusing on the hardcore audience and then growing it from there. Yeah. It, that's a very, um, on paper, it sounds, it, it makes sense, right? Like, okay, these people don't watch a show. Let's see if we can get them interested. But it, it's it's really the hard way of doing it. The, the best, the simplest form of uh, advertising is, is word of mouth. And that starts mm -hmm. with a, you know, you got, you got to start with home, take care of home first, the people who are who are really supporting you. Not not so much those ones who like everything you do, but I mean, you know, for, for the most part, that supportive fan base. And, uh, you know, I, I tweeted something out yesterday and of course i had a couple of people i don't want to call them trolling but they uh 
I don't really call you a troll if you actually follow me. If you don't follow me, then you're trolling. But a couple of people that got, you know, upset. Um, I have a reputation of, of, of caring too much about the little things, I guess. And I don't know. I feel like that's a, you know, you as a fil- fellow military guy, man, I think we were taught that from day one, right? Like the, the small details and everything adds up from there. Uh, but but you but if you can't do the little things, you know, no one's going to to believe that you can do the bigger things, you know, but that's something I think, you know, we yeah. learned from a really, you know, from boot camp and everything is uh, the small details. You know, I tweeted out. So Nikki Cross or what is she? A- A-S-H? N- Nikki A-S-H? Nikki A-S-H? And it, it's Ash. Yeah. OK, I didn't know what the hell. So she wins the uh, the raw women's title, I believe. And. What does Impact do? That they treat, they tweet out some British boot camp stuff, and you know what? If they said, in honor of Nikki Ash winning the Raw Women's Championship or winning her title win tonight, they don't have to acknowledge WWE their title tonight. Here's you know some clips from British boot. Like there's a way of delivering that information without just coming across you know desperate. But you know a couple of people said, oh you're um, you're ridiculous as usual. Da 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 and um. They're, the, the problem is they don't do anything to break that perception that they're writing off WWE, WWE's news. I won't say they're coattails, but piggybacking off what they do. That's been a perception. That's been a, mm-hmm. a criticism of them almost since the inception. And they, they do very little <laughs> to get away from that. It's you, you're, they're putting extra energy into trying to reach the people who don't watch the product. And it's just not, it, again, on paper, that makes sense, but it's it's a very difficult way. It's 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 Burger King saying we're gonna try to, uh, you know, the people who like McDonald's like burgers and fries, so we're just gonna try to we're not gonna be different. We're just gonna try to make burgers and fries, and because those people like burgers and fries, we're gonna get those those people to buy our food. Yeah, you got anything else on that? <laughs> yeah. So Garrett Kidney has basically made himself a career um, piggybacking off of WWE, and and look, Garrett Kid, Kidney, he's a bright guy. And he's a literal, like, way more than you or I will ever be, like, an expert in the history of Impact and TNA. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he has those clips, like, queued up. He has, like, Excel sheets and stuff, and he can he can put them up quickly. The the guy, when it comes to that, the, he is a genius. But I think he is realistic as to what Impact is, and it's, you know, a smaller company that, you know, if they can get some extra clicks by picking backing off of WWE, he's like all for it because what he's trying to do is just get numbers. Right, right. right. Now, do I think that's do that? Do I think that's growing the company? No. Do I think that's increasing the the fan base? No. Do are they getting more you know Impact Plus subscriptions from that? No. You know what gets more subscriptions? Big matches that people want to see. Right. That's what's going to get you the subs, not the fact that you're leveraging your, you know, your your old your old footage. I, I mean, not that many people watch a lot of old stuff right now you know it's it's you got to constantly crank out that new content that's what's going to get those new subscribers um i i I only know probably a couple of people who actually go back and watch some of the old stuff and uh right now i'm i happen to be one of them i'm watching uh 2006 impacts right now just kind of as i get time if i'm bored I'll, i'll kick on an old one i have it on a playlist on the impact plus app so um but I, I understand what he's trying to do he he's got a job to do and his job is to get numbers and that's all the bean counters look at it doesn't right, matter that right. they're cheap. They're cheap clicks, and that's what they are. They're cheap. Yeah, yeah, they mean nothing. Um, but you're, you're right. That actually, um, that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, and this is not us acting like we know. It's it's just you know common sense. Uh, his roles to get to get views to get clicks, uh, and he, he probably achieves that. You know, the, the the posts do get clicks. It's just there's just a perception. There's a perception that they have to to change um, if they actually do want to get those you know, people who aren't watching it to, to come over, but usually by, by really um, putting out a good product and the people who do view it, talking about it and uh, creating that buzz, like that, that's, that's, what's going to do it. Let's, uh let's talk a few things here. So on this episode, on this show, we're going to talk, uh, I've got a few notes from this, the, this set of tapings. This is, these are not spoilers. I'm not giving away match results. I'm not saying names of anyone who shows up. We're going to talk about one because uh, it's out there, but we're not going to be just, you know, dropping names, dropping spoilers. And, what you know, Mike, I completely forgot about spoilers. I, I'm not going to lie. And I, I, you might even be in this ballpark, too. We've become so accustomed to over the last year plus of 
genuinely being excited when you watch the product. Not excited, but surprised. Like if they have something, you know, like uh, when Private Party showed up, you know, like no one knew they were coming. We're just watching the episode and, and, and here's Private Party and Matt Hardy, you know. And now all of a sudden we got fans back there and boom, the spoilers are back. So it's pretty frustrating to see that and to have to, to try to avoid it and all that. Yeah, it, it's kind of the, the worst part about fans being back. And don't get me wrong, I, I love the fact that there was an audience there, but I, I I dreaded the day when the spoilers came because I really did enjoy not knowing what was about to happen before I saw it. It's it's like watching a television show, right? A, an episodic television show. I love the fact that whenever I kick on Chicago PD, I don't know what's about to happen. I don't know the storyline going into it. I'm just invested in it and I'm going to see it all play out. And that's that's the real frustrating part about them taping so many episodes in advance is that and even they're, they're taping the Impact Plus specials in front of a live audience in advance. And so, you know, that's essentially kind of a, a pseudo pay-per-view type bigger event. And, you know, a lot of people are going to know the results ahead of time. Fortunately, I've, I have uh, I have stayed away from them. I have uh, ignored the Impact Fan Nation page uh, <laughs> lately because I, I did notice some uh, some spoilers on there. I, I got some DMs with some spoilers and I was. I was like, hey, man, uh, not interested in that. Right, <laughs> so right. I had to correct a few people because when I do when I do I do my podcast immediately after the show is over. Right. I want to um, I want to react to what I just saw for the first time. I don't want to react to something that I saw that I already knew it was going to happen a couple of weeks ago. Right. And so, you know, that that's that's the rough thing, you know. It helped me out if Impact went live every week. They're just not going to. It's not, you know, financially beneficial for them right now. So um, it's just one of those, you know, icky things that we got to deal with. Um, you know, hey, I don't, I don't want to know the end of a, you know, a Marvel movie right before I'm about to watch it either. So, yeah, absolutely not. Uh, I, I had that problem in the past with the spoilers when people DMing me, and now. I still get it, but they're usually like, hey, I have a spoiler for you if you want to hear it. And I either don't respond or just say no. Uh, you know, I had a, but but I had that issue for a long time. People <laughs> just just DMing the spoiler like, hey, you know, what's his fuck showed up at the show at the tapings. I was at the, sh- the, uh, the show where Eddie Edwards won his first TNA title. And I mean, he uh, the Twitter knew about it within like I just finished celebrating. I mean, I, I was very genuinely shocked being there live. Uh, and by the time I look at my phone 10 minutes after the match, you know, uh, someone had already tweeted a picture out and the Internet's absolutely losing their minds that ba- Bobby Lashley would lose to to Eddie Edwards. Uh, and what's interesting is I was at a set of tapings. I think it was that one. As a matter of fact, I was sitting I was sitting um, on the non camera side and I was next to someone. And I don't know if I just saw what they were doing, but they were, they were taking notes or something. I don't quite remember. And I had asked what they were doing. And they said, I, you know, I send spoilers to the, uh, the wrestling websites. And what she said is, you know, they pay for the spoilers, but they will only pay the person who submits it the quickest. (laughs) So it's like a race between whoever, whoever is there to, you know, let's get this out to wrestling Inc or to whoever, you know, whoever it is. I said, that's interesting. I don't know if that's like common practice or, or or what, but I just found it weird sitting by someone purposely there for the spoilers, trying to, you know, trying to get paid for it. So we're not going to get away from it as, as you know, as long wow. as impact is taped and it will be. So I've got a couple topics here. Yeah, there's nothing we can do about it. Yeah, it's it's, you know, we just have to. Uh, avoid it you know i've I've spent a lot I've, I've had to spend a lot of time off social media just to avoid that stuff so i've got a i've got a couple topics here from the sets of taping some 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 are very minor but um uh, shout out to my guy pat you know he um i asked him to give me some spoiler free stuff and it, it sounds interesting so the first thing and this is i mean this is kind of minor but it's major at the same time uh he talked about the energy of the crowd that it really maintained throughout the set of tapings. How did you feel this, the crowd came off watching Slammiversary? Uh, you know, me, the way I, I took it, it was, I can't say it was like loud, loud, because I mean, it was probably half the crowd than there normally is, but you could hear it was more engaged. For me, I felt it was the most engaged audience they have had since, 
I, I can't even remember. Um, they had in Atlanta when they did that last set of tapings, they had a pretty good audience and then Windsor's good. But these guys, you know, you felt like you had impact fans in the crowd, which you don't always feel like you just feel like some people are just there for wrestling. Yeah, no, I, I felt like it was probably the best crowd that I've seen for them since Slammiversary 2018 and the Rebel in Toronto. Oh, yeah. Like that, that crowd was live for everything. And I thought this was real similar from, from the from the opening. Like, dude, Matt Stryker got a fucking chant when he came out. <laughs> so, really... like, you knew when Stryker came out, he got a chant. Like, they were pretty excited. They, they That was uh, going to be a hot crowd. And they, they were hot for everything. They were hot for stuff that I, like, I was watching. I was like, wow, this isn't even good. But those people are are going crazy for it. So, I, you know, I, I thought the crowd was just tremendous. I loved having them back, man. I, I think... Um, they, you know, impact, you know, did a, you know, they, they sold them a really good show and the crowd lived up to the hype, man. They were absolutely perfect the whole night. Yeah. You know, it, it's not uncommon to see the camera pan around the the audience and see people sitting on their hands. You know, you, you didn't see that, see that this time around. So, uh, I was, you know, I was encouraged that in the front row, the front couple of rows, I saw a lot of females. Uh, and and if you if you think of like the old TNA stuff, like you saw a, a a good female population within the crowd, you know, which which is odd that you see a whole lot of chicks at wrestling shows, you know. But I felt like watching Impact over the last couple of years, I just felt like it was just a a dude fest anytime they were on TV. So uh, <laughs> it was kind of nice to see a the the, the female representation there and uh supporting the show you know again looking looking and sounding very engaged um i was told too there's also going to be a good x division title match so it's probably not an iron man match like we got before well i can guarantee it's not but there was another good um x division title match here so i'm going to run something by you that i i had brought up a while ago do you feel that the x division title we don't have a world title on the tv basically now do you feel like the X Division Championship should be main eventing Impact every week? Because if you think of the TNT title, uh, that more often than not was has been the main event, and they've they've made it a very serious title. It's not on par with the world title, but I mean, it's up there. Like it's a serious title that people want, and they did it through a lot of main event matches. So, do you think that do you, do you agree with the place of the card in the of the X Division Championship, or do you think they should treat it like the main event? Yeah, no, I, I'm with you. It should be the main event. Um, anytime that Josh Alexander is defending that title and Kenny Omega is not on the show, Alexander needs to be in the main event, and they should be treating him as such. Because I think that the money match in the future now, and we'll, we'll talk about it Moose later, but now that you know Moose seems to be sliding down a little bit, I think the money match is Omega and Alexander. Um, title for title, whatever they got to do. Um, I, I think that's the big money match. And the way that you do that is you start getting him in the main events now, kind of, kind of like what you were saying with um, with AEW and the you know Darby Allen. I think is a great example. They were putting him in the main event of that show, even probably when he didn't deserve to be yet. But just by placing him there and making his matches feel big, people started to think that he was a main eventer after a while. I, I think that's what you do with Josh Alexander. You just put him right there in the main event. The problem is, is they don't tape every week, so you can't do it every week. So, you know, every time there's a TV taping and Josh Alexander's on the show, he's got to be the main event and it should be treated as something special. Right. And I think, uh, you know, kind of like the TNT title, they, they would just have new opponents every week. It wasn't so much about a feud. It was just about people trying to get that title off the champion, you mm -hmm. know, um, and, and that gives an opportunity for you to put you know, Josh Alexander, and then he takes on, um, I don't know. I don't, I can't think of a time he's wrestled Rohit one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe he has, but you get Rohit and you just, you just get him in the main event or, you know, you get Jake something and he just, you just have him in the main event and you don't overthink it. You yeah. know, I know that like WWE has always overthought their main event. You know, they, they were always afraid. Well, this guy's not a main eventer. We put him in the uh, main event. We're going to lose viewers. You know, so it's it's got to be people from this crop, you know. But I mean, what what was one of the best main events they've had in a while? Do you remember uh, when Austin Aries defended the title against Falaba? Oh yeah, yeah, in Mexico, right? Was it Mexico? Yeah, it was in Mexico, and it was great. Yeah, dude, that was. I remember 
that was the last time <laughs> brings a tear to my is the last time my kids have watched wrestling with me. <laughs> my son used to watch with me all the time. And then my daughter ended up moving in from Texas and got him into anime and all this stuff. And he just stopped watching wrestling with his dad. But that was the last time uh, I ever watched wrestling on TV. And I remember they were so engaged in that match uh, and cheering for Falaba and, you know, I don't think wrestling as a whole does a good job of telling an underdog story. They, they're they just always afraid to. You know, they're just afraid to take those chances. Um, So, you, you know, we talked about Kenny Omega, too. All I can say, I, I don't know the name, but I guess the next challenger for Kenny Omega is not not someone we think it's going to be. It's not going to be. You might already know. Do you know who it is? Unfortunately, I got a DM. Okay. And I, I saw the name, and I was like, a, I was mad about the DM, and then I was even more mad about the name. And I, I'm not going to say it here, but um, it's, you know, Slammiversary Impact took several steps forward. And uh, with this name being a challenger to Kenny Omega, they took several steps back, right? And it's it's going when it gets revealed, it's going to be a TNA LOL moment. And, and I think that's unfortunate because um, Slammiversary universally praised. And that doesn't happen with Impact because there's people that – that will watch impact just to make fun of it. Right. There's a guy on Twitter named Trevor Dame. He, he charges people Patreon just so he can nitpick impact and make fun of the people that watch it. Right. They're, those people are out there. They're sick people. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, that, that didn't, that, that occurred a little bit. I, I did hear some, some of that nitpicking, but for the most part, it was like an overwhelmingly positive experience for, for people that watched it. And there was a lot of people that were watching it just because Kenny Omega is in the main event. I don't think that's going to happen with this upcoming show with the next challenger to Omega. I, you're, I don't think you're going to get that. I think people are just going to roll their eyes and yawn and they're going to skip it. Hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah. I've avoided it so far. Uh, and I'm going to do my best to continue to avoid it. The problem is I don't really watch the show when it airs. I usually uh, I usually watch it a day or two later, so I, I'm even dodging uh, the results. I, I'm I'm pretty used to having to dodge the results, so I don't know. Uh, I can't even think off my head <laughs> who it could be that it would be that. Um, you know, I mean, I guess a couple names pop into my head, but I, I do I do like at least the the thought that they're going to work outside the box a little and not just be like, okay, well, we're going to use our four main eventers that we have. What did you think of Slammiversary as a whole? Like, I, I so for me, Hard to Kill was the best pay per view of the year. I just, I just think it was. That's just my personal preference. Uh, but, but this was number two for me, uh, with Rebellion being thing three. But uh, did you feel like this pay per view really delivered? Because Slammiversary is usually that pay per view that they always come come correct on. Like BFG is the one that we don't know what we're gonna get, but Slammiversary. Uh, they usually deliver, and you know, my take on it was that I like the flow of the show. I thought it, mm -hmm. I thought the uh, the surprises and everything was just really done tastefully, and it just fit throughout the course of the show, and and nothing was forced, and you know, it it just it just felt good. Like last year, they had, oh, you know, someone's pulling up, and it's a a, a car pulls up, and Johnny Swinger gets out. You know, it's just like. <laughs> Now we're teasing that it's somebody and it's not. And, you know, I just I just didn't care for the way they did it last year. But but this time around, I kind of dug it. So but what do you think about Slammiversary as a whole, though? Were you were you pretty pleased with it? I, I thought it was a two match pay-per-view personally. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it was a good pay-per-view. I thought that surprises made it good. Uh, but for me, it was like a two match show. Yeah, so I loved it. Uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and put it as the best pay-per-view of the year, at least on, on my card. I think um, part of that is because of the crowd. I thought the crowd was just fantastic. And I thought that the Ultimate X match and the Callahan Omega match were two of the best matches on Impact this year. Right. So when you, when you have that, so it's hard to kill. I, I think that the barbed wire massacre and then the six man main event were, were both really good. I thought both these matches blew those matches away. Um, so I, I think the, you know, with Alexander and TJP being the best match of the year so far, I would put, you know, Ultimate X and then right behind them, Callahan and Omega as like my one, two and three matches of the year. So I'm going to go ahead and put that up there. Crowd return on fire the whole night. Absolutely perfect. Like you said, the pace of the show, I thought the pace of the show was great. I thought the match placement, 
also was really good with you yeah. know opening with Ultimate X, and then they go right into the mix the mixed tag match, which I'm not a fan of those matches. But what they did that was brilliant, I thought, was they kept it short. They got all the spots in quickly, and the you know the baby faces went over. And I, I I thought it was really good. No no you know wild shenanigans. They had the cup spot that was kind of stupid, but I laughed. <laughs> so I I, th- I thought they I thought they did a good job there. Um, <clears throat> you know I. I liked the Morrissey and Eddie Edwards match, but that match was designed to be slow and to kind of take the crowd down a little bit. And so that way they can kind of build them back up. So, and that was more about getting Morrissey over. I think there's an argument whether that actually happened. I I don't know that he actually got over me personally. I'm more invested in his character because he was able to beat a guy like Eddie Edwards, but that doesn't appear to be what everybody else thinks. Um, you know, M- Moose and Saban was was a very good match, very good, you know, worked professional wrestling match. I just disagreed with the ending. Um, you know, the I think the the second best surprise of the night for me was Thunder Rosa coming out. Yeah. Um, oh, boy. And, and I, we, we can get into a little bit th- that more later. But I, I thought that that probably should have been promoted like they knew a month ahead of time. They should have just promoted it because they're she's a big star in AEW. You know, NWA doesn't really have like an audience that you're going to leverage from. So, but she is a big star in AEW and that's kind of a dream match of promotion versus promotion dream match. I thought that they should have promoted that, but their, their match specifically, I thought was really good. Um, so, and then of course the main event was classic, all time classic. I, I think that's going to be replayed on, you know, impact in 60 and uh, <laughs> you know, in the, the cutaways on Twitch, you know, they're going to show highlights from that match for years and years to come, but both matches, the ultimate X and that match. So, me, me so far, it's the, you know, that a couple of the matches of the year and it's the best pay-per-view that I've seen all year by Impact. See, I feel like I, I must have missed something because I was watching Deanna and Thunder Rosa thinking I was just going to see one of the best women's matches I've ever seen. And I just, it was good, but I feel like, I mean, I don't know if I have to watch it again, but I just feel like it, I was expecting it to hit another gear. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that they were short on time. Honestly, I think mm-hmm. they got shorted some time and they weren't the, the what they did was really good, but they never really got to where like, hey, we're in this semi main event. We're not in championship rounds yet. Right. Yeah. And so because they were they were waiting to get to that Mickey James spot. So. Right, right. Um, and and uh, that's usually a good sign when it, when a match goes shorter than you think it's supposed to. It's because they have something going on after because I feel like the match ended out of nowhere. I was uh, I was watching it. And I don't know if I was talking to my old lady or my kids or, or what I was, but I, I turned away for about 30 seconds to, to say something. And then when I turned back, Deanna was, was pinning her and winning, winning the match. And I was just like, I didn't see that coming. Like from what I had seen up to that point before I turned my head, I didn't see it going that way. So maybe, maybe it was a time thing. Um, I actually have tickets to that NWA show. The uh, Empower, mm-hmm. the women's show. So I'm looking forward to that. I got uh, tickets for that and then uh, one set of tapings. So because my old lady doesn't want me to disappear for four days. So I just <laughs> got one pay-per-view and then one one, one set of tapings. Um, Morrissey and Eddie, I didn't actually watch much of it because my... I don't know what I was doing. I don't remember. I was plugging something in behind the TV and I unplugged the TV by accident. And when I turned it back on, the match was over. So I remember being bored. And as you said, it was, you know, they had to slow it down, which I can appreciate that. Um, I, I've told the story many times. The last time I bought a Ring of Honor pay-per-view, 2016. And I was so mentally drained watching it because every match was balls to the wall from the very mm-hmm. beginning. And the energy was no different in any match and it was just it really fatigued me as a viewer uh and i've never i've never put the money into one of their shows since uh not that i'm totally against watching their product i just haven't paid for a pay-per-view for that reason so that makes a lot of sense but how did uh how did morrissey win the match because i I mean i honestly god have no no clue well it was it was kind of a fuck finish he he pulled a uh a chain out of his boot and clocked Mm -hmm. him and then uh, hit the power bomb and one, two, three. So they were, they were trying to protect Eddie. I don't think that they actually did protect him. I, and I didn't see the need for it. It's just, it's like old school trope booking 
of where you know you want one guy to win but you don't want the other guy to lose so we'll just come up with something stupid so um See, I, yeah Mor- morrissey's six foot nine he doesn't need to cheat to win right um that that is one thing that I can appreciate watching AEW is that you don't get too many of those BS finishes. Like they're not they're not afraid for someone to lose. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like uh, like Matt Hardy when he lost to Darby Allen. You know, like he I didn't agree with that loss, but he lost even though he was kind of hot with the segment he had going on. But you know, he showed up the next week and made money out of what he was given. You know, like just because someone loses, it's not it's not the end of the world. I mean. They they're definitely afraid to have people lose clean sometimes. Why not just have more C beat him? Like if you want more to see to get over, you win. You just have them win. Like see, and that's one thing I kind of like that AEW does is that they're just not they're not afraid for someone to lose. There's a couple baby faces that they're afraid to make lose. Orange Cassidy, Darby Allen, like they are they're scared to death for those guys to lose. But for the most part. I, I watch a lot of the feuds and, and no one's cheating necessarily. I mean, there's cheating going on, but it's, they don't rely on that to finish matches. You know, they, they, someone will lose a match and they just find, you know, that person makes money at whatever they give them the next week. You know, it's that, that's kind of one thing I've always kind of appreciated about them and impacts just afraid. Sometimes I, I use the example with Tennille Dashwood when she won the number one contenders knockouts match Instead of just winning the match, it was, you know, someone had to get missed it and she had to go get a, a, a cheap win. And it's like, if, you, if you're if you trying to build her up as the number one contender for your pay-per-view, like, then have her just win the match. Like, have her decisively win the match. Like, the other girls, Jordan Grace and them, will, they'll recover, I promise. You know, but it, it seems like they're really afraid to do mm-hmm. that sometimes. So that, that's kind of unfortunate for a, a pay-per-view finish. I had no clue. I had no clue that's what they did. So one of the things that I like that AEW does well and that Impact is starting to incorporate is squash matches. Yeah. Um, I, I like that they're bringing in some of these indie guys and just letting their guys beat the crap out of them. And that kind of makes them look like they're still badasses. So, hey, look, you lose a big match, but then you go on a tear, you know, beating up job dudes and then kind of working your way back up and you're, you know, you can challenge for another title again. Um, but, you know, they just don't have the deep enough roster to be able to do that. Yeah, they well, you're saying they don't have a deep en- deep enough roster for what? To to um to you know get get guys a bunch of wins on the undercard, right? Just to let them go on a tear for a while. Um, they 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 don't utilize enough enhancement talent to be able oh, to do okay, stuff okay. like that. Impact. I, I at first I thought you said they didn't have enough talent to do enhancement matches, and I, that's why I got kind of confused. Yeah, totally agreed. So that's why we see so many of the same matches over and over. Um, and because they're afraid to make you know make people lose too much, it's like no one gets hot, no one gets on a roll, and the, you know the, the enhancement matches have done wonders for W Morrissey, you know because he's a big dude. There's very few people on the roster that he can actually really fight. You know you you can't put him on the show every week against someone from the roster. Just it just wouldn't work. So you know that's a, that's a good way of doing it. Um. But yeah, the, that the ultimate match, the ultimate X match, they they did some stuff that you know we've never seen before. Uh, they you know they absolutely killed it on it. I mean, I knew Josh Alexander was going to win a match. I mean, you know they're they're clearly trying to build the dude up and and everything. But you know, top to bottom, I thought there was a lot of solid stuff. The uh, the reason that mixed tag match. We have differing opinions, Eric. I actually really liked mixed tag wrestling. I don't know why. The reason that one went short though was because she was also wrestling injured Mm -hmm. she said she has wrestling with a broken arm but i don't know to what extent but i know she was she was explaining that with ring of honor do you know what city their pay-per-view was in baltimore baltimore so they um didn't clear her the uh where not the, not the company, but the uh, the governing the, commission, the whatever. Athletic commission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, they they didn't clear the athletic commission, but in Nashville, she was able to get cleared, so she was able to to wrestle. Um, yeah, t- Tennessee didn't give a fuck. Right? No, absolutely, <laughs> clearly not, clearly not. <laughs> I, so I was reading something with her today. So apparently, she's not. I mean, big shocker. She's not exclusive to Impact. Uh, she's not does not have a contract signed. But when she negotiated her dates with Ring of Honor and Impact 
independently that she they were both aware that they were gonna she wanted to do both shows that's kind of kind of what i'm reading even though she said she put out a tweet saying you know i'm here to stay but you know the the dirt sheet stuff is that she's not she's not signed so who you know who really knows but i thought i think you agreed with me on twitter actually on that match i thought that was I thought that was like the most intriguing build to a match and it was only a you know one freaking episode but they they did it so perfect it just made sense like there was nothing to question there was nothing where's this going where's this coming from like it just made such perfect sense and when i found out the match was happening i was like dude i can dig that like we all knew it was going to be chelsea green scott Dumore tries to get him get himself over um and he had he had to be like, oh, you know, Simon Varsar, he's gonna be a hot mess. Like, you don't gotta say all that, dude. Just say, hey, can you find a partner? You know, I thought that segment was good until he had to, you know, pop himself. But, um, but yeah, that's that's what I, I heard that he was she was he was injured. There was something else I was gonna say about Chelsea Green, and now it's now it's kind of escaping me. Maybe maybe it'll come back to me. I want to talk about speaking of mixed tag wrestling. Have you heard about this homecoming? special event i don't don't even know if it's an impact plus show now because they're talking about putting stuff on youtube it's either an impact plus show or a youtube plus or both yeah the reason i say not an impact plus is because i think they're going to push the special events to they're going to try to promote them on youtube rather i think they're going to be on impact plus still but they don't want to call them impact plus shows because clearly there's streaming issues so you know, I guess they're trying to trying to do it through YouTube and everything. But this homecoming show coming up is actually a mixed tag. It's a uh, basically their version of the uh, mixed ma- mixed match challenge that WWE did. So where it's um, I don't know if it's a tournament necessarily, but they're going to be crowning homecoming king and queen, which sounds kind of cheesy. But so I'm actually looking forward to it. I think what I was told though was that they didn't build to these matches on the TV show, which I guess makes sense. Cause this shows in like less than two weeks. So I, yeah. so I guess, so I guess that makes sense, but it'd be like those one night only shows that was just randomly random card throw to, <laughs> thrown together. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a throwaway show. They're just checking a box, making sure that their subscribers are getting their, uh, their monthly show that they have been promised their monthly exclusive show. So um, I, I don't care about it. I, I know it's a thing that's going to happen and it will have, it'll be literally of no consequence to anybody. Um, right. you know, unless, unless they somehow get Josh Alexander to have a big title match on the show. Um, yeah. but if it's, you know, uh, you know, the, the mixed match challenge, I, you know, I'm not a fan of, of, uh, mixed tag matches unless there's like a, a good story behind it, but if it's just random, I don't care. But, I thought that the Cardona Green and Dashwood and Brian Myers story, I thought that was really good. And I thought the angle was shot well done, even though it was kind of hot shot it a little bit. You know, it only had like a two day build. I thought it was very well done. And I, I thought the way that they produced it was awesome. So, um, you know, if, if they were doing something like that, yeah, great. But if it's a full show, that's all of those things, you know, I, I'm, Oh, I'm glad that my boss Garrett doesn't really watch Impact, so I don't think he even knows that that's going to be a thing. I'm probably not going to have to write about it, so that means I won't have to worry too much about it. <laughs> no, that that kind of stuff intrigues me a little bit. Um, and, and you know, I'm sure there'll be like an Eddie and Alicia pairing, and I don't know how serious the pairing is going to be. There's no doubt in my mind that we're going to get like some random, uh, you know, independent, you know, Johnny fuck fuck with, you know. <laughs> sugar mcsweet cheeks uh from the indies you know just some randos probably thrown in there but i don't know i'm interested i think it's i think the concept fits the name but it's like a couple years ago you actually had a pay-per-view called homecoming that was pretty good and we're kind of i don't want to say erasing that history but you know that was like the first lax and lucha brothers match and Mm. it's like you're almost you know erasing that for for a silly show but We'll see. It it is what you what exactly what you said it is. It's just a you know a throwaway show. Um, what did you think of? So who do we all get a slam anniversary though for for surprises? So we we talked Chelsea Green a little bit already. Who else did we get? Dude, okay, so we, we talked we talked uh, Thunder Rosa. No way was I, not one I saw. Coming. Yeah, yeah, no, I I didn't see No Way Jose coming, and I wish I didn't see it at all. <laughs> I I <laughs> felt like it added an element to the show that that. <laughs> I, I I had a, I felt like it added a fun element that's 
yeah completely missing from the show because we were discussing this on a cool factor podcast um everyone in impact's entrance is exactly the same you know there's there's no unique camera angles there's no nothing i I think there's a couple like violent by design and and uh you know decay where they switch Mm -hmm. stuff up a little but for the most part it's just the same camera work the same camera angles they it's it's all the same so i i just thought it was kind of a breath of fresh air it was just something different he showed up in nxt around the time that i stopped watching it there was just they brought in a couple guys around that time i was just like i'm I'm, i don't like this what the hell are they doing so but but that was interesting because he was released last year right Mm -hmm. when they were you know last slam anniversary and then uh, another one released Matt last year was eight in English. So, cause he's, um, you caught that promo, right? The drama King. Unfortunately. Yeah. All right. Are you not, uh, not big on him? You know, you know, so it's so funny. So, um, no, no, I'm not. I think he's a good announcer and if they're bringing him in as such, I think that would be, that would be good. So, you know, to, to go back to, to Noe Jose, I ain't got no okay. issues with Noe Jose. I'm actually glad they're bringing the guy in because they've been making fun of him not having a job on TV. I'm like, you have to bring the guy in now and let him do something. I just wish it wasn't at Slammiversary in that spot. When that when TJP's spot came available, which I have no idea why. I don't know that he's ever coming back. I have no idea what's going on with him. Yeah. But um, when his spot came available, I, I think what I did in my own head is I booked it myself better than what they did <laughs> and when they didn't live up to that, that expectation that i created for them i got pissed right and so it's like hey it's nothing against no way jose he's a fun character at the bottom of the card he, he's a he's a big fun guy that can lose matches and i think that you need those guys around um yeah. and and kids will love him and so when you're 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 coming to the shows people are going to love the guy he gets the crowd energized so nothing against no way jose keep keep him on the roster that that's that's fine you know, Aiden English is just an, another kind of, uh, he was a manager, more of a job guy. He, he transitioned to announcer and, you know, they're, they're bringing him in. And, you know, I, I got kind of into a debate earlier with, with somebody because they were saying, you know, making, they're like, you know, they're making fun of AEW for being WWE light, you know, by bringing in Andrade and bringing in Aleister Black and, and these other guys. And there's rumors about Daniel Bryan coming in and like, you know, AEW can't sign everybody, blah, blah, blah. They're just trying to be WWE. And I'm like, well, no, no one says they should sign everybody, but they should sign the top guys. It's not like they're signing scrubs like No Way Jose and Aiden English, right? <laughs> bringing them on their roster. So, and yeah, I think that ended the conversation uh, pretty, pretty far after that because they they realized, hey, you know, Impact's doing the same thing. They're just getting the lower level guys, and I'm not mad at Impact for bringing in WWE guys because you got to hire people from somewhere, right? right. And WWE kind of took all of the top indie names and brought them over there. And now they realize they bloated the roster. And I don't think you should discriminate against somebody because of where they used to work. I think that's silly. That being said, yeah. um, Aiden English, I, I, I saw him in NXT. I thought that his gimmick with Simon Gotch was funny. It just never really clicked. And I, I don't think he's particularly like a great wrestler or anything. So we'll, we'll see if he's coming out doing his theater gimmick, if, if that works, or, you know, I, I think it's signing him as, is having a WWE guy for the sake of having a WWE guy yeah. when there's 15 times better out there, right? They, they, they could have had Weston Blake, who is, who is a great wrestler. He was, uh, you know, Wesley Blake in WWE. Mm-hmm. They, they could have brought that guy in and he's a fantastic wrestler. And so they, they go for the Shakespearean type of type of dude. So it just, it just depends on, on what they're looking for. Now, as far as surprises go, I, I want to, I want to transition over to Jay White. You called this one on he, your podcast. <laughs> okay. Yes. So I'm going to put myself over a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Because I, I was calling that for, for weeks and weeks and weeks. And now people are saying, oh, the surprise that nobody saw it coming. I saw it coming. And then I actually had a guy kind of confirm to me that, yeah, it's, it's probably even going to happen. Um, and then it actually happened. I was, I was out in front of that thing and, and nobody else saw it coming. So really what I want the audience to do is just recognize that I had something right all along and it, and it <laughs> came true. Because so. you – it was a logistical thing because you – yeah. We're saying he wasn't booked for a certain show out there. And yeah. then when you kind of know how the tapings work and, you know, because the travel's long, like 
it's like, okay, if he's not booked for the show, he's in the States. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you just kind of picked up on that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I just kind of, I just kind of read the tea leaves a little bit and I saw that, Hey, look, he, he's coming, he's coming in for new Japan resurgence, but he's not, he's not booked for the Tokyo dome show on the 24th. Um, I was like, he could conceivably come there and then it actually makes sense. The social media, he had tweeted at impact a couple of times and Carl Anderson and Scott Demore had been posting pictures of themselves in bullet club doing bullet club tweets and things like that. I was like, you know what? I think Jay White's coming in and I put it out there. And then a guy from new Japan kind of said, uh, he goes, you're onto something here. And he wouldn't exactly confirm it for me, but he, he kind of confirmed without confirming it. And then right before it happened, he, he got into a group chat that we were in and, uh, and said, Hey, it's about to happen. And so I was like, Hey, chalk one up for the good guys. I got it. <laughs> yeah. Cause we, I think all of us fans, we, we have our, assumptions on who was going to show up so i was sure that i knew diana peraza was going to win the match because she has you know the title versus title match at triple a coming up she even on a smile smaller scale had a has a small uh title versus title match with Eva Lee at a independent show so i i just knew i was like she's not going to lose but i was talking myself in a tessa blanchard um <laughs> Who was my other one? I had a I had a second one that I was. I, uh, oh, Kylie Ray was the other one I had, which which I guess I wasn't too far off the scent with that one. Well, she Kylie Ray was working Warrior Wrestling the same night, so it, it just couldn't have worked. Oh, got it. Yeah, they put on a good show, Warrior Wrestling. Man, I've uh I've been up there once, once or twice. They they, they put on a pretty good show. I've been I, I always want to get there, but it's like the uh it's either on my reserve weekend or it's it's always something it's always coinciding with something yeah but i but i've been wanting to go up there yeah i i just yeah i guess i didn't pick up on that because i think she maybe wrestled holly dev that weekend or something like that i don't remember I, um but yeah i i talked myself into kylie ray because i was like well we didn't get that bound for glory match so you know here's a, here's a great opportunity and uh to circle back before we move forward, uh, to circle back a little bit, you're, you're totally right about Aiden English, about sometimes they just sign guys for the sake of being a, just for the sake of them coming from WWE. Um, mm -hmm. I don't look at a guy like Macklin in that because I, I see him just kind of rebranding himself and everything. And, you know, I, I can totally dig that. Uh, so Jay White, though, to go back to what you're saying, I've actually only seen him wrestle like once, I'm not going to lie. And it was with uh, Ring of Honor. I think they were doing the uh, <laughs> the uh, new prospect tournament, and I think he wrestled <laughs> Leo Rush or something like that. This is like 2016 or 2015, something like that. It's the only time I ever see him wrestle. And I remember thinking, okay, this guy's cool. But then when I knew he kind of blew up with a bullet club, I, I kind of remember that ROH stuff. I was like, dude, I didn't really see him, see that star power to him. But I mean... I watched him a lot earlier in his career. He he's a legit main event guy. He he's absolutely legit. He became the IWGP champion. He's had incredible matches with uh, you know Tanahashi and Okada and uh, and all those guys. He you know plenty of match of the year candidates over there. So he uh, he he can work that main event style. And if we get the Kenny Omega Jay White match, that's gonna that's gonna really get people to notice Impact Wrestling. Um, I, I think that next to Josh, so bigger than Josh Alexander, like within the, within the impact world, Josh Alexander is the biggest one. But if you're talking about the outside of the little, the small little impact bubble, Omega and Jay White is going to be that match that if impact is able to put on, they're going to get those people from outside of that bubble. Right. Cause you're not just talking about AEW. Now you're also talking about one of new Japan's, you know, top five stars. Their, their former world heavyweight champion and then bringing that match into your, into your universe, I, I think is a huge get. Um, the only problem is, is I just don't know when they would be able to do it. Uh, it doesn't look like it's going to be scheduled for August. So if they do try to do it for bound for glory, it's the right, right around that same time as new Japan's G1 tournament. And it, and actually the, the G1 final ends about 36 hours prior to bound for glory. So you're talking, wow. you're going to ask this guy to go wrestle in Japan and then get on a flight. It's about a 16 hour flight into Vegas. And then, you know, 
and then get a couple hours of sleep and then go right into bound for glory. So that's a huge ask. I'm not saying it's impossible. It is possible, but that that's what they would be asking him to do. And I just don't know that that's going to work out. So hopefully maybe we, maybe we get that in uh, September. I, I'm not too sure. Yeah. That's going to be pretty odd having two guys from outside the company fight for the title, but you're right. I mean, it's bigger than any match impact could, could put on if we're just, you know, being realistic uh, from a popularity standpoint, you mm -hmm. know, and, and everything, everything that Kenny Omega has done wrestling wise with impact has been good. I mean, we, we can talk about the rich Swan match where, you know, I know you had a similar opinion that it never felt like he was going to win to where at least with Moose and Sammy Callahan, we probably knew they were going to win, but we felt like there was moments where they, okay. where they could. And, um, so there's supposed to be more surprise appearances, you know, including young talent and stuff at this pay at uh, this type of taping. So I'm excited for it. I've heard uh, a lot of good things. I've only heard one like major bad thing that involves Tommy Dreamer. <laughs> I mean, dude, I, I don't think you if, if anyone could have seen my reaction when he came out as the uh, anthem representative. I dude, just I I'm in my bedroom. my damn remote. I, I mean, it's so late. It's like, who we need someone who in the back. You come here and play this role. You know, I do. I, I, I just. I've said this a few times. I'm gonna repeat myself. If they had Dixie Carter do it, who lives there, she, and I feel like she would have done it. She still tweets about the damn company and posts on Facebook about it. I feel like if she would have come out that like the headlines would have been stupid for, mm -hmm. I, I mean, in a good way, like it would have been nuts if like Dixie Carter showed up on impact last night, you yeah. know? Well, and it, it would have made sense because she still owns a minority share in the company. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. It's, and then, you know, they do this Tommy dreamer thing. Like one of my coworkers is not going to fire my boss. It doesn't matter what the scenario is. Uh, that that's not going to happen. Like someone that I work with every day side by side is not going to be like, Hey, you know, I was empowered to, uh, you know, to release management today. There's just nothing. Just, I heard that music hit and this fool walks out. I'm just like, I'm, I'm fucking done. I'm, <laughs> I'm just like the insistence on, you know, finding something for this dude is just, the funny thing is with the impact audience, though, he doesn't get that pop. Like you could, you could have Tommy Dreamer appear in an AEW uh, battle royal, and you'll get AC Dub, and all of a sudden he's just the, one of the most popular guys there, you know. But then he shows up on Impact. He's just this, just some dude. Well, because he's there all the time, and yeah. he's always the mystery tag team partner. Yeah. I honestly thought at one point I, I had myself sold on the fact that he was going to be Fallabaugh's partner in that four way match. <laughs> so somebody brought it up to me. I was like, fuck, that's it. You know who? I think it was Lewis that brought it up. I was like, yeah, dude, that actually oh, makes fucking sense. And I was like, damn it, that's what's going to happen. And so in that sense, I'm grateful that it was no way it was hey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I remember I was, uh, I had talked myself into Davey Richards returning about for glory a couple of years ago, be Eddie's mystery partner. And man, that fucking dreamer music came out, those Dusty Rose pants. I was like, no way. And that was the yeah. match after uh, James El Ellsworth was the surprise opponent for Eli Drake. And I was like, what am I watching, dude? <laughs> what a disaster that was. Yeah, absolutely. That, oh, my. that So that was Bound for Glory. What was it, 2019? Was that yeah, 2019? Yeah, it was two years ago. Yeah, that was not good. Not Yeah, yeah. that just wasn't a good show. I didn't <laughs> think it was. That, so Slammiversary, they, they do a good job and, and they, they really did it this year. You know, Slammiversary 2018, one of my favorite shows ever, right? 2021 is like right up there because what they did was, is they under promised and over delivered. Right. I thought they did a really, really good job because they only teased three surprises and we got like six or seven because, right? because you got to count. We also got Finn Juice coming back. Yeah. And I true. thought that, and I thought that was really cool. And they, they, they squashed a couple of jacked up jobbers in uh, Shira and, uh, and Fulton. But, um, I, but I, I did think that that was really cool. And so, you know, you got, you got, you got your, the, the, your tea surprises. And then of course they gave you a lot more than what you would even bargain for. Plus they gave you two classic matches. And so, yeah. um, but with bound for glory, 
they always hype it up as their WrestleMania and it never lives it's up to not that. even close. Yeah. No, it's not it, even it, their best pay-per-view of the year. Yeah. No, it, it rarely. So I'm like, they need, you know, they need to move the hall of fame to slam anniversary for whatever reason. They have like this mental block around bound for glory where they're trying to hype it up to be this commercial success and it always fails, but slam anniversary, they just put some badass shit in it every year and it always succeeds. And so, uh, I I think I'm I think I'm on the train that you know hey Slam Anniversary is you know the the biggest show of the year not Bound for Glory yeah absolutely um, but you mentioned under promise over deliver I've been I mean my God using that phrase from the beginning since I started doing what I do and I said that's always that's just always the key to like engaging. Um, engaging television or just engaging marketing in general, when you sit there and you hype up like, oh, this, you know, this and this and this and this, and, th- and then it doesn't live up to that um, and you disappoint people like they, you you wrote an article saying, you know, like, where's the buzz for Slammiversary, you know? And it, it actually worked for them because, you know, last year they overhyped the thing to where you thought, you know, Jesus Christ was going to walk down and God was going to be his manager. <laughs> yeah. And you know, you didn't have that this year. You didn't, you know, you didn't feel like Daniel Bryan was going to show up. Well, I, I mean, no. I can't believe anyone would think that, but you didn't even think they didn't even tease like, Hey, Daniel Bryan might show up. You know, they didn't, they didn't feed us any kind of crap like that. They just, you know, they, they threw us off the scent pretty good. I mean, I got, I got to say, um, yeah. But, so so for- the reason why mm-hmm. I thought that it, the it had lost some steam is because I just didn't think that Callahan was a credible challenger to Omega, um, and it's just because of his record on TV and pay per views. He always loses, and always. so yeah, he if if they were going to prop him up as the challenger, then he should have beaten Eddie Edwards at Hard to Kill, and he should have beaten Trey Miguel at Rebellion. If he if he was the guy that they were going with. And by all accounts, they, they knew that they were going to give him a big title match. I don't know that they knew it was going to be a slam anniversary, but they knew that he was going to be one of the guys to face Omega. Right. So you you fix that by just, you know, let, let him win, right? Wins and losses matter. It's yes. not the, it's not the, the you know, end all be all. It's if you lose, it's not a career killer. However, if you're going for a title, you should be at least on a win streak. And he, he fluked his, he's a baby face. They turned him baby face, right? He, he was a heel. They turned him baby face. He fluked his way into getting a title shot. And then they think that we're, he, he's supposed to be credible because he was able to, to powerbomb Kenny through a table, right? And yeah. at no point did they ever present him as a credible threat. They presented him as being crazy. Um, and that, I think that played into the story of the match. And the match was excellent. And I knew it was going to be excellent because Sam yeah, McCallahan, say whatever you want about the guy. The guy fucking delivers. Yeah. And so um, I just wish that they would have built the guy up as a threat to the title beforehand. That was my big knock on, on that show. Yeah, and, and you're right. I, I've talked about it many times that he kind of got that title shot based off of technicality. Mm-hmm. He got he got into the number one contender match off of technicality. Like he'd even beat Eddie Edwards in that match. So have him beat freaking Eddie Edwards, you know, uh, and it was clear when they did that six way that they wanted to do Sammy Callahan because that, you know, the good brothers came and prevented them from winning. Like, so they forecasted big time, like, Hey, Sammy, Sammy's going to fight Omega. So that's why, why do we even think Moose was going to win? But like Moose was the one that won that match. And then he gets a impact plus title defense and then sammy callahan who didn't legitimately win a match to get into the number one contendership didn't uh didn't win the other match we we're talking about and all of a sudden he's he's main eventing slam anniversary like that was just something that just made zero sense to me but um match was phenomenal man do you think that pizza cutter was real uh yeah i do i but i, I don't know that you know pizza cutters aren't like crazy sharp but um, and I did see Omega slicing his forehead with a razor blade right afterwards. Like he did the whole go face down on the mat, cover his face. You can see him rubbing his, his head. So you can tell <laughs> he was cutting himself, but um, it's an old wrestler trick. But yeah, I, I, I it was probably a dull pizza cutter, but it was legit. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. I mean, they, they, they did multiple spots with that thing and the fork and all that. I was like, oh my God, because they teased the fork at Bound for Glory with like Sammy and Brian Cage. No, no, Brian Cage did uh did use it on him. Mm-hmm. I was in the arena, so I couldn't quite 
tell, but I thought I remember Sammy got bloody from that. So I know Sammy lost. I know that much. <laughs> yeah, that's what he does. Dude, that whole stable OBE, man. I mean, they couldn't. They they couldn't beat my aunt and uncle in a tag match mood, dude. I mean, <laughs> that was just just embarrassing. And Sammy really has not gotten that momentum since. He just he does a lot of he commits to everything he does. So it's like it works. Let's uh, I want to say talk about Slammiversary as far as like the biggest winners and losers of this pay per view. Like, who would you say just when you're when you're looking at this this show and it's a great show and a lot of amazing things happen who do you think is just like the one person or team or whatever that's just like the big loser of the show that just well it, for for yeah for me it's moose mm-hmm. um because you know he he went from being probably the most protected guy on the roster for a long time to add hard to kill loss right sacrifice loses to rich swan and then he goes into against all odds even though he lost to kenny omega against all odds he was still protected in that match because the young bucks came down it took three people to beat him okay i get that um but then he now he comes into slam anniversary and it should have been just a big win over a legendary competitor in chris saban who is not a guy that's a threat to any titles moose should have got that that way he could stay competitive and get his rematch against kenny omega but instead he loses on a fluke roll up and I just didn't think that it was necessary. And I know we talked about earlier, like you know, losing a match isn't really a death sentence, but losing, you know, four big matches in, you know, the first six, seven months, right. When you're supposedly one of the top stars in the company, I don't think that's good. I, I think that you build big stars by having them win their biggest matches. Right. Mm. And, and Moose isn't doing that. So I, I don't know what they're thinking. I don't know what they don't see. But I, I have been on you know his side for a long time. I think that he's the guy that when Omega leaves, he's the guy that carries them into the future. I see a big feud between Moose and Josh Alexander you know, in 2022. Um, and they're really going to have to work hard to get Moose's momentum back because he's not the killer that he once was. So um, I, I thought that he was the biggest loser uh, of, uh, of Slammiversary. So I, I totally agree with, with, with all that. Do you think – so this is kind of the – what I had said was that clearly there was the where Eddie and and Chris Saban came out during the main event, and I had said, well, Eddie Edwards lost his match. They couldn't trot two losers out there to stand up for Sammy Callahan or whatever, <laughs> stand up for Impact. Like that just wouldn't have gone over. Like you can't send uh, two two and I'm speaking as far as their matches go. You can't send two losers out there to confront the tag team champions. So right. I feel like they were just like, well, one one of the guys has to win because I think they're going to go. I think that's the next feud for the Good Brothers. I'm going to assume is with Eddie and Sammy because there's no one hot in the division. You can't have. You just gave us a four way match, so you can't really uh, use any of those teams. I mean, I guess you could, but there's no one to challenge the Good Brothers. So I think that's um. Uh, that's what I think they're going with it. So it's like one of those guys had to get a win, but. Uh, it was very shocking to to because now that's multiple that's multiple matches he's lost. I mean, Moose is a big dude, but I mean that's multiple matches he's lost to guys considerably smaller than him. Yes, you know, like Rich Swan's what five foot six, one hundred and eighty pounds, and Saban's Moose a- six five, three hundred, and he's losing. That's weird. Yeah, I mean they're they're about the same. So Rich Rich Swan and Moose was my favorite match of the year, actually. Oh, it's um, incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Um, so my loser, I'm I'm actually gonna say it's two losers, and it's not as uh not as major as, as Moose, but it's it's Madman Fulton and, and Shira. <laughs> they were part of the worst angle of this. They 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 got the Eric Rowan spot, right? Like loose of the rock in three and a half seconds. I I don't know what it is with wrestling companies that don't want to build monsters, you know. With what Madman Fulton, like what they're doing with W. Morrissey right now, I I just can't help but to think, well, why not? Why didn't you do this with 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 Fulton at any point? Like he was never credible as a monster who could win matches uh, or or beat anybody. Um, I I can't think of a match he's won actually against someone good. I don't know what his finish is. I don't. Uh, 
there's a there's a few people in Impact. I don't know what their finishes are. They don't they don't do a good job of branding branding them very well um, as far as what as as far as their finish. But I thought those two guys they're supposed to be monsters. They were supposed to be the difference makers in the X Division match, and they were banned from ringside. And then they get a match that they they just lose. Like it, it it's just a quick match. They look like crap, and I don't know what you know. They're supposed to be bodyguards. They're supposed to be henchmen. Like you can't take any of those guys serious at this point, and I don't think there's anything you can do to fix it at this point, especially with Fulton. You know, Shira doesn't really. I don't. He doesn't wrestle that much, but Fulton, we have, we're going through multiple years of him losing. I talked about Sammy and OBE, like that, that that stable just always lost. You know, Fulton couldn't even beat Tessa Blanchard. I, I know, granted, it was like by disqualification or something like that, but I mean, his his momentum is like so gone. I don't even know that he had momentum. You know, a couple of years ago, he wrestled uh, Ken Shamrock to open Bound for Glory, and I was like, well, surely he's going to win this match, and he didn't. You know. <laughs> So there, there's some guys that's like you feel like they're going to throw you a bone at some point. And it, they clearly don't see that in Mad Men Fulton and, mm-hmm. uh, and Sherry either, who I think has done a lot. I think he's done a good job of shedding the old, uh, the old character, which I actually thought was kind of funny, that, the dance and all that and the music. But they, I think they've done a good job of, sh- of shedding that. But, you know... There's no, there's nothing you can do about do with these guys at this point. Like they're, they're not going to be credible. They're just going to be dudes on your, on your TV show who lose matches. What about, what about your big winner? Yeah, huge, huge owls. Uh, What about your big winner of the show? Like, I mean, there was really multiple. Yeah. No, I thought there were there were really great winners. You know, I I think that the the guy that probably upped his stock the most was Alexander, because this was really. You know, he 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 won at Rebellion, but I think this was like the really the first time that I think the wrestling world was watching him and he excelled, right? He he, he you know he did he did win at uh, Slam Anniversary in that three way match, but that three way match was just another three way match that they've had a bunch of times. He looked good in it, but it was nothing really spectacular. Um, th- this is you know he he got a lot of buzz for that Iron Man match, but you didn't have the entire wrestling media watching all at the same time talking about it. Yeah. Right. But you had that at Ultimate X. And I thought that he was the conduit to all the big spots. Um, he was spectacular in the match. He, they, everything built to him, make him look good. And he absolutely looked great. Uh, and he's looking like a guy that could challenge Omega down the road. Uh, he looks like a guy that they're building to, to be something big. So that, that would be one. And then, of course, uh, you know, Perazzo getting a clean win over Thunder Rosa, even though the match, you know, was a good match. It wasn't a spectacular match, but she got a good clean win over, you know, a top female star in the industry. We're not talking about some scrub here from, you know, we're not talking about like the third or fourth level down NWA star. We're talking about AEW, the number two company in North America, you know, the, probably the second most famous woman on that roster. She defeated her soundly. Uh, and, and I thought that, that was a, that was a cool moment. And then she got her big moment with Mickey James and kicking off that feud. I think that was great. So she, she's actually my winner, Deanna, for yeah. the reasons you're saying because she was she had no con, no competition. I mean, this current knockouts division, she's just treading water. Like, hey, you're gonna wrestle Susan, you're gonna wrestle <laughs> Kimberly, who I like. She just doesn't win, um, and and it just seemed like she was a level above everybody else. I think her and Ellering can do something good. I think Ella Rings looked a little sloppy since since I, I just don't know how much wrestling she did before coming to Impact. Uh, I, I think she's looked a little sloppy, but um, she's someone that I I think is immensely talented. Um, and they could probably do something together, but I think after beating Thunder Rosa and then having the angle with Mickey James, she has now elevated herself well past those girls, but into just another, just into another level where the story is like, yo we need to find someone who can beat this girl. And uh, it, it might have to be someone from outside the company or we might have to hire someone different. Like I think um, I just feel like the, 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 her wrestling matches, we know she's going to win against the current knockouts is just behind us. And she's just getting ready to take, you know, uh, just, just, just turn a corner, go a new, a new path and, and, you know, 
just take her career to the next level. Uh, I remember watching her do like knockouts, knockdown, all that stuff, dude. I, I would have never in a million years thought she would have hit this level of uh, just quality with her matches. I was always like, dude, I like Deanna Perrazzo, but she just, there's no character to her. Like she's just a, some chick out there wrestling, you know, with, with the Italian colors. And that was it, you know, and this virtuosa thing, she's really just taken it to the next level. And I, I just see her uh, just t- taking even a step further. So, uh, but there were there was a lot of winners that there re- there really really were, I mean any anyone who won a match really is is, you know getting ready to take take the next step. So, uh, I don't know. You got you got anything else on your mind about uh about this company? No, man. You know, I I, I think other than one thing that's going to play out on TV uh, in the next in the next few weeks, I think that this is the most excited I've ever been for a set of TV tapings that they just had. Yeah. I think bringing new faces in and out is exciting. And those surprises are very exciting. Um, and they're in a fortunate position right now where it's, as far as talent goes, it's a buyer's market. The WWE releases, yeah. you know, from the last few months have just kind of flooded the market to where they can kind of be picky and choosy about who they want to bring in. And it's clear that that's what they're doing. Um, I, I felt like not bringing in Blake and not bringing in the Iconics was a mistake. I think that they, that those three, like I, I'm not a big fan of the Iconics, but I know that a lot of people are, and that would have turned some heads, right? And I think that's what this company needs is to, to not only generate buzz, but to, when they get those new eyeballs to keep them, right? And the way that they keep them is having cool storylines and badass matches. And I think that they, uh, that they're on their way to, to be able to do that. And so uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm excited for the future. I, uh, you know, I'm really excited about uh, bound for glory coming to Las Vegas. Uh, looks like I'm probably going to be able to go um, have it, haven't, uh, haven't cleared it with the wife just yet, but uh, <laughs> you know, we, we do have a place to stay in Vegas should we go. And so I think that that might be something that we can swing and, and hopefully I can get some uh, media credentials now that I am a uh, part of the interview. <laughs> I'm a trusted interviewer now. So right. uh, I, I, I slurped Merce and I Moose and I slurped up uh, Ross Foreman. So hopefully I can keep getting my credentials. <laughs> hopefully I'll get on that level one day. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I plan on being there. It's a, uh, I mean, Las Vegas is a very affordable flight. So I think that makes, you know, there's rumors about them kind of basing their show out of there, which makes sense. It's an easy place to travel to. Uh, mm-hmm. My dad lives in Las Vegas. It's actually my future home. I'll move there in a couple of years. Uh, but my dad lives there. So, I mean, it's, it's simple. I go stay there for, with him for a few days. So I fully plan on it. Um, my birthday is in October and I do wrestling. I do some kind of wrestling show every October. That, that is my only like wish for myself. Uh, and I I already had locked down like October 2nd or 3rd to, uh, I was going to go to Indiana for a wrestling convention and show. And I completely forgot about Bound for Glory. So I got the old lady to sign off on that. And then I forgot about BFG. And I was like, okay, uh, I got this going on too. But, you know, but you get a Vegas trip out of it. So um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I went to Bound for Glory in Chicago. And that, that was a good one. That was a pretty, pretty packed house. Everyone, everyone, the internet was just like, oh, there was five, six, 6,000 people there. There was 2,000 people. Yeah. Maybe close to three, but. People are like, no, if you look it on the internet, it says no, six. I'm like, that's how many it holds. There was not <laughs> that many people there. No, so somebody went to the Wikipedia page and put 5,000 on there. But I, as the reports that I saw coming out of it were like 1,700. So, Yeah, people were trying to send me that wink- Wikipedia link. I was like, dude, I was <laughs> there. I promise you there was like 2,000 people there, you know, in that ballpark. I was like, there was empty seats there, like trust me it wasn't it was a great audience it was engaged it was it was good stuff i was like but it was not five thousand people like i don't know what the hell hopefully one day hopefully one day though that would that would be great if we uh if we got to that point um but it i guess the last comment i want to say about you know some of these surprises is that i think uh you know, and and I think AEW does a good with it job with it too. But Impact's been doing a pretty good job of of when someone comes to the company from WWE. For the most part, they they get an opportunity to reinvent themselves. Like because it worked with EC3. I mean, he, he just completely reinvented himself. And you know, I kind of see it like I, it, Macklin hasn't wrestled a lot right now. But I'm like just 
huge fan all of a sudden just like overnight as I, I saw this dude i was like dude i love this guy i like uh big, brian big, Myers, big macklin guy yeah, yeah good good um like i really i'm a brian myers guy you know like i i think he's done good with what what they've given him i think he's he's mixed being funny with being you know with being not being a comedy joke act and you know now when i'm like okay someone from wwe is coming over i i I'm more inclined to be like, dude, I want to see what they can do with their own creative mind now. You know, like it's different with no way. He's the exact same character, mm -hmm. you know, but some of these, I'm, I'm curious to see what they do. Like, I would like to see the iconic show because I want to see what they can do without that WWE writing team or, or telling them what they should look like or what their, their gimmick should be like. I, I would just want to see, you know, what they can do. So, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to give them all a chance and I'm, I'm excited to see who shows up at the set of tapings here. So I think that'll do it for us tonight. We're going to wrap it up. I kept Mike on the computer here a little longer than I wanted to. So, and I know I got good, work. Man. I'm a, I was happy to be here, man. This has been a lot of fun. It's been a long time. We need to do this again soon. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll be consistent with it. My schedule's much more realistic now it's something uh i can control better so uh, bring bring we'll, your gear to bound for glory man maybe we'll do something do something in uh, vegas yeah we'll on location yeah we can definitely do that that'll be a lot of fun so all right so guys for mike this is bq thanks for uh, checking out impact republic podcast and uh we will we will get it going uh monthly again and uh just appreciate the support as always we will talk to you guys next time peace peace